different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract. And you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a knee specialist talking to a new patient called Jason Riley. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Mr. Riley, you've been referred to me because of um, a problem with your knee, is that correct? Uh, yes, it's my right knee. It's very painful. Okay. I've got some information here from your GP who's treated you for bursitis. But can you tell me about how this developed and what's happened so far? Mm. Well, about two years ago now, my knee, uh, this knee, swelled up and was really big. Mm -hmm. It didn't hurt. And it, well, it just looks really strange. Um, I'd been on a week's golf holiday in Portugal, and the knee was a bit dodgy all the time I was there. Uh, well, when I got home and the wife saw it, she sent me off to the GP straight away, who said that it was what people used to call housemaid's knee. <laughs> that caused a few laughs at home, I can tell you. <laughs> then I remembered that my mum used to get that in her shoulder. Uh, it's really called bursitis, isn't it? Yes, but he said not to worry, to rest up a bit and wait and see if it went away. And it did in a few weeks. Right. So I was okay for a while. Then, about a year ago, I got a new job. I used to be a, a painter and decorator, but I retrained as a carpet fitter. So I'm on my knees quite a bit. Uh, goes with the job. And after a while, uh, this must be about six months ago, the knee swelled up again. It looked really red this time, and I had a sort of dull pain as well that got worse. Okay. Uh, also, I felt slightly shivery and feverish. The GP said I probably had an infection and gave me some antibiotics for 10 days or so. That seemed to do the trick, and I felt much better, but the knee was still a bit swollen, and it ached sometimes. Did you try painkillers? Oh, yeah. After a bit, the doctor suggested ibuprofen. But that always seems to give me a tummy upset, so I stuck to paracetamol. Mm -hmm. I'm still using them on and off. At work, they put me on to doing things that didn't need a lot of kneeling when I first went back, but only temporarily. Uh, and I put ice packs on my knee to bring down the swelling as often as I could every few hours. I tried to take breaks, too. Oh, and my GP suggested some exercises to protect the knee, uh, lying down on my back and raising the leg, yes. which seems to reduce the aching. Mm. In bed, I uh, made sure I slept with a pillow under it to keep it a bit higher up too. And um, was your knee still swollen? Yeah, it was. So then the doctor drained off some of the fluid by sticking in a needle. I remember he said he got 20 millilitres out. Right. After that, he suggested that I try some supports in my shoes. I couldn't really see the point of that, but apparently it's to do with your arches, which I guess does affect your knees. Yes. Also, he told me to make sure that I have plenty of padding on my knees when I'm at work, and I've been doing that. Good. Uh, he 
told me that I should think about losing a good few kilos as well, but I like my food, as you can see, and I haven't made any progress with that so far. But things weren't getting better, so then he started giving me cortisone injections. Uh, I've had three of those so far. And what effect did they have? They really helped. Much less swelling and the pain's better too. But that's the problem. He now says that with those sorts of drugs, you can't have more than three of them in the same knee in a year. I'm up to the limit and it, and it keeps coming back. So, so really, I'm hoping you'll be able to come up with something better. Okay. Well, let's have a look, shall we? Talking to a new patient called Sylvia Gunn. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. You've been referred to me because of some pain in your face. Now, I've got some notes from your GP, but perhaps you can tell me in your own words about the pain, uh, when it started, and uh, what's happened since? Well, it began about three years back. Uh, out of the blue, I got this terrible shooting pain in a back tooth. Mm -hmm. I've never felt anything like it before in my life. Mm -hmm. um, see... It was a tooth I'd had a nasty abscess on a few years before, and I assumed that it had got infected again. Anyway, I went off to the dentist as soon as I could get an appointment. So he did some x-rays, but he couldn't find anything wrong, which was very strange. Was the pain continuous, and did anything in particular trigger it? Uh, it came and went, and it lasted just a minute or so each time, but it really got bad when I brushed my teeth. I always use an electric toothbrush. Um, they're so much better than the usual sort, but yes. he didn't like that one little bit. Um, I even tried to persuade the dentist to whip the tooth out there and then because oh. I was so sure that that was the problem. But he told me he was pretty sure there was nothing wrong with my teeth at all and I ought to see my GP. And your GP has diagnosed trigeminal neuralgia. Well, first of all, the GP told me to try painkillers. That was to exclude things like a migraine, I think, but the pills, they didn't have any effect at all. So then he sent me off for a CT scan because he said it might be a very bad case of sinusitis. I'd had that before when I was a teenager. Um, or he said even nerve damage, but that was all negative too. So then after all that, the GP eventually put me on an anti-epilepsy drug, which seemed to help. I see. Uh, so how is it now? Well, the pain sometimes goes away for weeks at a time, but then it can come back uh, a dozen times a day. Fortunately, I get a tingling feeling in my jaw when it's going to start, which I can recognize as a sign. 
So at least I get a bit of warning before the pain comes on properly. Um, and I can try to find somewhere quiet to sit down. But the pain has now begun to spread. Yes. It started to happen in my eye, too, on the same side as the tooth. Mm -hmm. I was doing okay until the firm where I work moved to a new office. It's a lovely new building, um, and everything was fine at first until about three months ago when the weather started to improve and they turned up the air conditioning because yes. lots of people were complaining about being too hot. That's when I started getting pains in the eye, and I'm pretty sure it's connected. But the system's the same all over the building, and it's not as if I'm sitting in a draft, so there's not much I can do about it. I've tried wearing glasses all the time, and that seemed to help a bit, at least at the beginning. And these pains in the eye, tell me how long they last and how often you get them. Uh, it's getting worse and worse. Over the last fortnight, it's been every day, and sometimes every hour, and it's really excruciating. It's getting me down, and I've started losing weight too, what with the worry and the pain, and I've had to give up my yoga class, which I loved, because you never know when the pain's going to come on, and well, that's making me feel very isolated. Um, I really hope you can do something more for me, Doctor. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You will hear a lecture based on the subject of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now read the question. What are the symptoms of ADHD? Most kids could be described at some point as inattentive, impulsive or hyperactive. Explanations for this behaviour vary widely, ranging from the child being overtired to overexcited. However, when such behaviour lasts for significant periods of time and when it interferes with, with life at school and at home, the explanation may be due to a condition such as Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. Some studies suggest that about 2% of primary school age children have ADHD, while others have suggested that almost 18% have ADHD. However, the majority of researchers put the figure at between 5% and 10%. Question 26. Test, you will hear a talk based on an essay published by the Public Library of Open Science 
on the topic of seasonal hunger. Now read the question. Most of the world's acute hunger and undernutrition occurs not in conflicts and natural disasters, but in the annual hunger season. This is a time of year that is characterised by a lack of stored food from last year's harvest, high food prices and lack of jobs. Nearly 7 out of 10 hungry people in the world, or about 600 million in total, are either landless rural labourers or members of small farm households. Many of these 600 million people live in areas where water or temperature constraints allow only one crop harvest per year. Question 27. Out of the test, you will hear a lecture based on the subject of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now read the question. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is a growing global epidemic that is significant in both developed and developing countries. Morbidity and mortality from COPD will rise as populations age. Furthermore, as the mortality from cardiovascular and infectious diseases falls, the occurrence of COPD will become more common in society. This is supported by the current trend, which indicates that more people are dying from COPD each year. In addition, COPD is associated with several other diseases, such as osteoporosis, diabetes, glaucoma, and sleep disorders. Question 28. Dr. Brian Fleming, interviewing a parent of a child presenting today. Now read the question. Come in, Mr Murray. Oh, I see you've got Kate with you. Yes, that's right, Doctor. She's had an accident at school. Oh, dear. Well... I'll bring you both in here and get Kate comfortable on the couch first. Oh, good. I think she's in quite a bit of pain. Yes, obviously, and she's looking very pale. Now, can you tell me what happened? Well, she had a fall at school, actually. It was in her gymnastics class, and I don't know, I think she landed awkwardly in one of the practice exercises. And how long ago was that? Well, the school called me to pick her up, and I came straight here, so... About an hour ago, I think. Question 29. Dr. Tamara Kayali Brown is a bioethicist at Deakin University. She specialises in the ethics and philosophy of mental illness. Now read the question. I asked for women who had been diagnosed with major depression or bipolar disorder because I wanted a variety of different types of depression and women who had gone through treatment and were feeling better. I only wanted women, though, because gender issues in depression had already been studied quite a bit, and I wanted to focus on experiences of depression. So rather than including different genders and comparing them, I just wanted one gender. And it made sense for me to focus on women because, first of all, there are more women diagnosed with depression than men. And secondly, I'm a woman, and there is some evidence out there that 
there are more open conversations that happen between people of the same gender. So it made sense for me to ask for women. Question 30. You hear us. Emily Johnson is a neurologist at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, and I spoke to her earlier. Now read the question. We're like I think most people are surprised to hear that. We often think of epilepsy as being a childhood disease, and it is common in children. Then the incidence kind of tapers off in adulthood and in midlife. But then by the 60s, and especially by the 70s and 80s, the incidence of new cases of epilepsy is actually higher than it is in children. So a lot of people are surprised to hear this. What kind of epilepsy is it? Is it? Because there's various kinds of epilepsy. You can get major seizures, you can get what's called petit mal or absence, behavioral things that happen. Is it stock standard epilepsy where you drop down and convulse? Great question. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be, although that can certainly happen. But then the other type is called focal epilepsy. And that is the type that starts in one part of the brain and then can spread to other parts. is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You will hear a lecture based on the subject of asbestos. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
asbestos is a naturally occurring mineral rock that was mined in Australia from the 1940s to late 1980s and used in a variety of materials and products. Unlike other rocks made up of small particles, asbestos is made up of fibres so thin that they can be invisible to the unaided eye. If asbestos materials or products are disturbed, these fibres can be released into the air and remain for extended periods of time, where they can be inhaled to the deepest parts of the lungs. Asbestos is a group of naturally occurring silicate minerals that are made up of fine fibrous crystals. Three of these are chrysidolite, blue asbestos, amosite, brown asbestos, and chrysotile, white asbestos. Asbestos was a desired resource for many companies because it is also relatively cheap to mine and process. Unfortunately, however, asbestos is also a highly toxic, insidious and environmentally persistent material that has killed thousands of Australians and will kill thousands more this century. Australia and the UK have the highest rates of asbestos-related death in the world. This is understood to be because of the amount of asbestos used in these countries and the relatively high proportion used in the, of the most dangerous types, brown and blue. Asbestos was considered a valuable product due to its resistance to fire, moisture, chemicals and heat, and also its suitability as an insulation material. However, due to such devastating diseases in people, a national ban on asbestos came into effect on the 31st of December 2003. People may be exposed to asbestos in their workplace, their communities or in their homes. If products containing asbestos are disturbed, tiny asbestos fibres are released into the air. When asbestos fibres are breathed in, they may get trapped in the lungs and remain there for a long time. Over time, these fibres can accumulate and cause scarring and inflammation. As a result, breathing can be affected, which leads to a serious health problem. Research has shown that there are several factors which can help to determine how asbestos exposure affects an individual, including dose, which means how much asbestos an individual was exposed to, duration, how long an individual was exposed, size, shape and chemical makeup of the asbestos fibres, source of the exposure and individual risk factors such as smoking and pre-existing lung disease. The inhalation of asbestos fibres may lead to a number of respiratory diseases including lung cancer, asbestosis, pleural plaques, benign pleural effusion and malignant mesothelioma. Although exposure is now strictly regulated, patients continue to present with these diseases because of the long interval between exposure to asbestos and the clinical appearance of disease. Presenting signs and symptoms tend to be non-specific. Thus, the occupational history helps guide clinical suspicion. People particularly at risk are those who have worked in the mining of asbestos, especially blue asbestos. Other at-risk jobs include shipbuilders, insulation workers, fitters, carpenters and electricians. Immediate family members of workers are also at risk due to washing clothes which may have been contaminated with asbestos fibres, even though the amount of exposure is very small. Because exposure to cigarette smoke increases the risk of developing lung cancer in patients with a history of asbestos exposure, smoking cessation is essential. Patients with asbestosis or lung cancer should also receive influenza and pneumococcal vaccinations. The three most common asbestos-related lung diseases are asbestosis, lung cancer, mesothelioma, and I will now outline their symptoms, prevalence and treatment based on a recent US study. Asbestosis. 
Firstly, people with asbestosis have symptoms such as difficulty in breathing and dry cough, and it affects approximately 200,000 patients, with 2,000 deaths annually. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. In this part of the test, you will hear a lecture based on the subject of anaphylaxis. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Anaphylaxis is a serious, rapid-onset allergic reaction that can result in death. Severe anaphylaxis affects the whole body and is characterised by life-threatening upper airway obstruction, breathing difficulties, rash, edema, and in some cases, hypertension leading to shock. Anaphylaxis in children is most often caused by food, and breathing difficulties is a common symptom. Importantly, there is usually a background of hypersensitivity reactions such as hay fever, eczema or asthma. Anaphylaxis is a medical emergency where immediate treatment is needed to prevent potential death. When exposed to a foreign substance, some people suffer reactions identical to anaphylaxis, but in which no allergy is involved. These reactions are called anaphylactoid, which means anaphylaxis-like reactions. In anaphylaxis, the immune system must be primed by previous allergen exposure. On the other hand, anaphylactoid reactions can occur with no previous allergen exposure at all. An example of something that can bring on an anaphylactoid type of severe reaction is radiographic contrast material.
the dye injected into arteries and veins to make them show up on an X-ray. Although the mechanism of an anaphylactoid reaction is different, the allergy treatment is the same. I will now introduce some statistics on anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis occurs infrequently. However, it is life-threatening and can occur at any time. Milder forms of anaphylaxis occur much more frequently than fatal anaphylaxis. An Australian survey of parent-reported allergy and anaphylaxis found that one in 170 school children had suffered at least one episode of anaphylaxis. Another Australian study showed that in areas where native Myrmesia ant species are prevalent, one in 50 adults have experienced anaphylaxis after stings from the native Myrmesia species or honeybees. However, deaths from anaphylaxis are uncommon and estimated to occur at a rate of 1 per 3 million population per year. In areas where sting allergy is common, the death rate may be higher than this. Hospital-based studies suggest a death rate in the order of 1 per 100 to 200 episodes of anaphylaxis treated in an emergency department. There is some evidence that the incidence of food allergy and anaphylaxis like that of allergic rhinitis and atopic dermatitis, may be increasing. The likelihood of an individual having anaphylaxis is influenced by the following points. Age, gender, atopy, the genetic tendency to develop classic allergic diseases, source of exposure, prior history of any type of allergic reaction, after an initial exposure to a substance like bee sting toxin, the person's immune system becomes sensitised to that allergen. On a subsequent exposure, an allergic reaction occurs. Severe allergic reactions are usually triggered by a limited number of allergic exposures. These include injection, swallowing, inhaling or skin contact with an allergen by a severely allergic individual. Examples of injected allergens are bee, hornet, wasp and yellow jacket stings and certain vaccines which have been prepared on an egg medium and allergen extracts used for diagnosis and treatment of allergic conditions. Antibiotics such as penicillin can trigger a reaction by injection or swallowing. Typically, a severe reaction caused by a food allergy occurs after eating that particular food, even a small bite. Allergy to peanuts is an example here. Skin contact with the food rarely causes anaphylaxis. Foods most commonly associated with anaphylaxis are peanuts, seafood, nuts and, in children particularly, eggs and cow's milk. A severe allergic reaction from an inhaled allergen is rare. An increasingly recognisable example is when an allergic individual inhales particles from rubber gloves or other latex products. In emergency department studies, food allergy is the commonest cause in children, responsible for about 80% of anaphylactic reactions in which the cause has been identified. Whereas in adults, Foods are implicated in only 20 to 30 percent of cases. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.